Good evening, welcome to another edition of the Jazznet Podcast, the independent Rangers podcast by fans for fans with all the content that's absolutely free, coming to you in association with Forest Precision Engineering. I'm your host tonight, Brian Archer, and as always, we'd encourage you to get onto the Jazznet website and check out our forums for all your latest Rangers news and discussions. We're live tonight on the YouTube channel and we would ask that you continue to share the pod on social media, spread the word and please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Before I introduce my guest for tonight, I need to give another mention to our partners over at Forest Precision Engineering. They're a Glasgow-based engineering company who have been a big commercial supporter of Rangers for a number of years and we're delighted to have them supporting the pod. If you want more information about them, please visit their website at www.forestprecisioneng.com. They also have a stunning executive lounge in the Ibrox main stand. And for more information on that, email the club at hospitality at rangers.co.uk. Right, now to bring in my guest. Joining me tonight is Stuart Weir. Stuart, how are you doing? By, by popular demand, I'm doing very well, Brian. Love what you see again, still talking to me, even 48 hours after our last show together. Yeah, I feel like this is a bit of punishment having us uh, on tonight after um, being all positive on Friday. And now we need to pick the bones out of that horror show that was um, yesterday afternoon. Excuse me, you were all positive. I think if you go back and listen, I cautioned, I thought maybe Rangers would win 2 0, but I did caution about the fact that I had seen uh, better Rangers sides and better Rangers teams in this one struggle against Motherwell. And lo and behold, I was right again on Saturday. I didn't really want to be right, but I was. And, um, you know, people will say, oh, it's added a bit of excitement to the title race. I think it's the excitement most people can do without. But nevertheless, um, it's turned into a kind of half-decent weekend after all. Yeah, no, you were right, and uh, that's why you're an award-winning sports journalist, and I am not. Thank you. Um, I know that you're desperate to get on to um, back post defending. Me? The, um, Me? Surely some mistake. But the first um, point I wanted your thoughts on, well, is the team selection. We spoke on Friday about the manager's kind of rotation of his team, and we've seen it again as we kind of expected um, in came Raskin, Ridvan, Sterling and Dessers, and out went Lawrence, Barisic, Silva and Cortez, albeit Cortez was through injury. Um, did that start and line up concern you at all even before kickoff? Uh, n- n- not really. I think uh, I think we covered this point on Friday night. I mean, the the manager is between a rock and a hard place just now. If Rangers were to put two, uh, a run of two or three games together and then suddenly run out of steam, people would be hugely critical of Philippe Clement saying that, you know, you've got enough players there, you should be utilising them and using them. I think all in all, Motherwell, um, you know, a game against Motherwell at home should have been a given that Rangers would win that match. Unfortunately, I don't think anybody saw that kind of performance, that level of performance, you know, a week ago, Rangers beat Hearts comprehensively. You know, in midweek, um, they played a, a really good 45 minutes to win the game at Kilmarnock. I don't think anybody saw the events, um, you know, at Ibrox on Saturday, uh, unravelling the way they did. But we're at a, a, a time in the season where you are going to get teams who suddenly flap a bit and who suddenly, you know, I wouldn't say lose their, their bottle, but the fact of the matter is that you are, are up against a, a motherwell side who didn't need to be spectacular, who didn't need to be, you know, tactically um, fantastic, who didn't need to be verging on genius to beat that Rangers team. That Rangers team almost beat itself. And the fact of the matter was that that Rangers should have been up for the game more and more organised than they actually were. And I don't put anything down to a change in personnel. I think whoever comes in, you'll never get it like for like. Very few teams other than probably Manchester City or one of the one or two of the great Manchester United teams over the year have been able to do that. But I think that you're looking for guys to actually turn up and put a shift in. And all in all, I thought it was an absolutely chaotic performance from Rangers over 90 plus minutes Yeah but for the second game in a row Stuart we didn't start the game well at all 
Um, and Motherwell pretty much got themselves on top almost straight from kickoff, even before we get to the opening goal. Is that a concern for you that the last two games were just not started well at all? That and that's after you know games where we had we had seen the team start well. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is not a, a Rangers team where you could basically say you know go back to you know other teams where one would be enough. You get a goal contain the other side, don't give them any opportunities, don't give them any chances and you'll win the game 1-0. I mean, the, the, the first manager that I can recollect basically saying, you know, um, if you score a goal and your defence is good enough, you'll win a game, would be Graham Souness and, and he was pretty pragmatic when it came to that approach. This stranger side isn't on anywhere near that um, quite yet, but the fact of the matter is, you were looking for more of a performance from Rangers to get on the front foot, to get an advantage, and to press at home. I mean, this is a Rangers side that is going for a title. They're going for a championship. This is not a Rangers team that's eight points behind playing catch up, and therefore anything will do. So I think they put themselves under a, a, an immense pressure on Saturday, simply because they they didn't go off to the best of starts. And if you listen to what the manager has said in subsequent press conferences um, and, and, you know, in other chats with the, the, the press since the final whistle, he he basically said that he was disappointed in how Rangers started the game and then not only started badly, but they really toiled to pick it up. You know, you, you look how long it took Rangers to get back onto level terms and as, as quick as they got into level terms, they then lost it again. Um, and I think, I'll, I'll be honest, I think they're hugely fortunate to end up in, everybody going back into their work on a Monday morning with Rangers still with a points advantage over their biggest rivals. Yeah, it was definitely a poor, a poor 90 minutes overall. And Mullabell's opening goal comes from a long ball over the top that Sutter fails to deal with and they work it well into the box for the opener. But we've seen that numerous times this season where Rangers defence get caught with a long ball up the field and both Sutter and Goldson have been culpable in the past. Is this an area for you that needs addressing? Well, I, I think, you know, you, you, you tend, historically, you tend to have, if you're playing uh, four at the back, you've got two central defenders. One of, one of them is a guy who attacks the ball and attacks the opposition strikers, so to speak. Another guy drops off and basically sweeps up. It's easier to do that if you're only playing three, three at the back with three centre backs. You can play two as man markers and one guy that drops off. But if you're playing two, it tends to be that one guy goes for it or you can play it on either side of the pitch. That if it's on the left-hand side, this is my ball, you drop in behind me, vice versa. The, the, the two at the back or two central defenders for Rangers actually looked as if they hadn't been formally introduced to each other. It was almost like they were speaking a completely different language, never mind two guys that had actually played together regularly during the course of the season. And and that, for me, was um, a, a real concern. I, I, I think Goldson this season has had a mistake in him. I, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll see what other people other people might say, but it's almost that like he goes from having a good season to an indifferent season to having a very good season to being, you know, not at the races the following season. And I think he's been a bit stop start this time around. Um, all in all, the back four just did not defend well. And it looked as if somebody, uh, every time Motherwell, um, you know, Motherwell were quite tactically aware, I'll give them credit. In effect, if you launch a long ball and punt it deep into the Rangers' territory, chase it because Rangers are flapping at the back. And and that's not really the kind of confidence giver or confidence booster you're looking for you from your back line. You're looking for them to take possession, control the game and, and start moves off. You're not looking for them to be turning into some kind of blind panic. Um, you know, and 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 making Motherwell look even better or more effective than they actually are. Yeah, to, to be fair to Motherwell, I thought their big striker Bear had a had a really good game, but um, Golson just got bullied all afternoon. It's probably one of the poorest games I've seen him have. Is have we just got a bit of a problem in terms of how we potentially look at that centre half position over the 
the coming few seasons with Goldson. He's always been the mainstay, but we all, I guess we always knew that, you know, it hit his peak. He's not getting any younger. Is that a position that we're going to need to kind of replace in the, in the next few windows? But you, you, you're saying he's getting older and they might have hit his peak. There are a great many defenders out there who are still defending at the age of 33, 35, 37, nearly 40, who are still doing a fantastically capable job. Um, I think, you know, I, I sometimes wonder if he takes too much on himself or does he think he's actually better than he actually is? You know, sometimes you just have to stick to the basics and put your head through the ball and clear your lines. It's it's not what the team need. It's not you know it, it's not very sort of gratifying on the eye. But it's a you you do your job and you do it to the best of your abilities. And sometimes this season, I think the easy option would have been the better option to take rather than that rather than trying to play some you know. Brazilian 1970 or Dutch 1974 type football, you're not capable of it. Do the simple things, but do them well. Yeah, I think there is an element of that. Um, the next incident I wanted to get your thoughts on was midway through the first half, there's a challenge on Ross McCausland by Dan Casey. In real time, it was right in front of me, and in real time, I thought it looked a bad one, but the referee doesn't even give a foul, and VAR don't intervene. For you, was it worth at least asking the ref to have an all Were you surprised it didn't seem to go to a VAR check? No, I, can I say something, Brian? Nothing surprises me currently with referees or their decision making. And, 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 you know, I'm surprised even less, so to speak, now that VAR is on the scene. I made a point uh, on, on radio that when VAR came into Scottish football, that was all well and good, but you're still reliant on the referees and officials who find it find it inca- themselves incapable of making a call um, in normal time or on the pitch or when they're five yards from an incident. And you suddenly ask these guys or their pals to make the decision in the video booth uh, or in a, in a truck, in a car park somewhere. For one... There is an element of cowardice in all of this. It's almost like if I didn't see it, somebody's going to cover my ass or pull me out of a hole by watching a rerun of it. If the person with a video analysis, um, you know, next to him doesn't do it, then you end up with absolutely incredible decisions, as we've seen. Not not just on Saturday, I have to say. Also today, there were some baffling decisions that doesn't leave Scottish football in a good place. And, and Saturday, the tackle on McCausland, if you are a referee or if you are an official and you do not see that, then at best you are incompetent. And I will say, you know, I, I, I will state my case on that one. If you do not see that and you do not see a foul or the net effect of that challenge, then what the hell are you doing in the football pitch to start with? And it's pointless putting you in the VAR booth because you wouldn't see it there either because you don't know what you're looking for. So, you know, McCausland probably woke up this morning with a really sore leg. You know, who knows what your fitness will be like over the next week or so, but that's a referee who will basically turn up again next Saturday with no sanction against them to look to pick up a, a rather sizable fee again and Scottish football you know is is in a dire a dire position thanks to some of the officials and it's okay saying oh well these things even themselves out over the course of the season currently we've we've got one set of supporters saying if the decision goes against their biggest rivals or oh, get it up you yeah, that's what it feels like and then the next day you've got the other fans saying, oh, now you know how we feel, get it up yet, that's what you deserve. That is not a good place for Scottish football to be. I'm not saying there should be unity amongst fans, but there is not a set of supporters in Scottish football, especially in the top flight, who cannot basically list one, two, three, four, five decisions that's gone against their team this season that, you know, VAR was supposed to correct or was supposed to be a safety net 
And instead of that, what we're getting is people saying, let's just scrap that. Let's go back to the days when you had a clueless referee make the calls, because at least then all the judgment was taking place, all, all the judgment took place on the pitch, and you lived with the decisions that were there and in the now. For me, that one um, on Saturday was particularly baffling, given that the other incidents that we've had players sent off for um, in recent games, mainly Cifuentes and Sterling, um, for challenges that weren't half as bad. I mean, it's getting to the point where somebody's going to have to explain what a red card does now. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, how, I mean, but you, you have Infantino tucking in his dinner on Saturday night at Loch Lomond. <laughs> and Scottish football this weekend has been an absolute shambles. I mean, and he's talking about, you're fine, we're not going to introduce blue cards. I mean, you don't... Forget blue cards. You have officials who don't know whether it should be red or yellow cards that people should be getting. The whole handball situation, and I, I refer to the Hearts game today, Hearts got a penalty where... One of the Celtic defenders has pushed his teammate into the ball. It's hit his hand. He doesn't know where it's coming from. He's got his back turned. It hits his arm. The guy in VAR calls the referee over who doesn't know what he's watching in the first place. None of the Hearts players have appealed for it and they suddenly end up with a penalty. Now, I know you could say, oh, Rangers have had these decisions all season. The point I will make and reiterate is then it's not good enough just to say, well, we get that, that call last week, it's your turn this week. That's not a good place for football to be. That turns football into an absolute lottery. In fact, it turns it into an absolute joke. And if that's how, if you're going along to football matches, expect to see proper, true decisions. A referee before VAR, before video analysis, gave what he thought was his true and proper call as a linesman would be offside and all the rest of it. And it was over and done with in an instant. Now they're making programmes about it. And I don't think this is a great place for Scottish football to be in. And, you know, and, and, and Rangers fans will say, oh, it's affected our team more than anybody. It hasn't really. It's affecting every game and every team. And until that part of it's stamped out, then we, we really are in a dangerous place. Because you can see what's going to happen over the last half dozen games of this season there is going to be one monumental cock-up, one monumental blunder that's going to cost a team absolutely dearly. And at that point in time, yeah, the opposition fans might be able to celebrate. Who knows? It could be Rangers fans celebrating, it could be Celtic fans, it could be Hearts. Who knows who it might be? But there will be one decision where people will look at VAR and say, no, we do not need this, we do not want it. And to be honest, Scottish football is being ruined by it. Yeah, I think it's kind of, as you say, there's not one set of fans in the SPFL that, that can say they've not had poor decisions go against them this season. Um, and it feels that we're talking about this every week. For you, is this the worst standard of refereeing that, that we've seen? Or has it just been highlighted more now because of VAR? I would say it's been highlighted more now because of VAR and because of the amount of cameras that are at games. I mean, listen, you only need to go back and uh, see some of the footage from matches of yesteryear. I mean, there's a classic in an old firm game where Celtic, you get a goal that's suddenly ruled offside and Rangers basically take a quick free kick, break up the pitch, and suddenly it's like the Celtic goalkeeper and one defender confronted by eight Rangers players and, and they, they almost make an arse of it and the referee I think it was JP Gordon from from uh, Newport on Tay was the referee you know 1978 he had his own worries um, in terms of what he took from AC Milan but that's an entirely different story but you know referees decisions if they were caught on camera back then then it was they were unlucky let's say but now every referee decision is being scrutinised and you know, there are so many of them that are just utterly, utterly wrong. And the, the, where at least fans are, I mean, any fan out there that says, you know, I, again, oh, it evens itself out, you're kidding yourself on. It doesn't even itself out because it leaves you in a place where you're actually saying, we could have had this, we could have had a penalty, we might not have had a goal against us. And that's happening in every single match. And that's just not good enough. Yeah. It it feels like we're, we're talking about it 
more and more this season than we than we have done in the past. And it and personally I'm of the opinion that we should just scrap the or I I think now we've got enough evidence to say that it's ruining the game up here. But aside from all the decisions that's getting wrong or not intervening in, I actually find it just ruins your experience of the game because you can't celebrate a goal anymore because you're worried no. that it's going to get chopped off or an incident that nobody else seen but somebody that's watching 20 replays might have spotted something. I said I, I said the other 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 week there, or in fact I said a couple of times perhaps on, on Talk Sport. One of the most famous goals and famous goal celebrations you'll you'll see was Kenny De Luce scoring against Bruges in the 1978 European Cup final when he scores and wheels away and hurdles all the advertising boards at Wembley and runs right out to the crowd. If that was today, that goal would be disallowed. Why? Because soon as did the guy, soon as did the defender who's running in towards him, he and, and soon as would tell you himself, I thought the guy was going to do me, so I did him first. As it transpires, it also got a fantastic wee dink pass through to Douglas, and Douglas scores. That goal, that goal would never have taken place. Douglas would have been booked for his celebration if it, if indeed he set off on a celebration, because he probably would have stood watching for a goal. And and think, think of all the joyous moments as Rangers fans you've witnessed, be it you know Derek Johnson, be it Colin Steen, be it. You know, Ali McCoy's, David Cooper, Marco Negri, or oh, he didn't celebrate very much. You know, uh, Nicky Yelovich. Think of all the fantastic celebrations. You know, Ed, you know, Edu, Morris Edu scoring against Celtic in, in stoppage time to win an old firm game. All of those celebrations would never have taken place because people would just have stood about waiting for VAR. And, and to that extent, it's absolutely killing. Killing football, stone dead. Excuse me, I, I need a drink here. I asked my daughter to bring me a bottle of something, right? And this this shows you how fifteen year olds think. It's like I end up with two bottles of vodka kick. One, <laughs> one, one, one decidedly tangerine. The other, a kind of duck egg blue, if you ask me. But uh, I'll tuck into one of these just now, if you don't mind. Right. Will you um, will you get yourself a drink? Um, I'm going to give another shout out to our friends over at Football Prizes. We're currently running a competition to win a signed and dedicated Rangers shirt from Richard Goff. For more information, how to enter, please visit footballprizes.co.uk slash product slash golf. Um, now, I hope you're um, suitably fueled up, Stuart, because um, another point I wanted to come to was Despite how poor we played, we still actually had enough opportunities to win the game. I mean, you think about the chances that, that we had, you know, Dessers, Silver, Roof, all had good opportunities to score. Are we paying the price for not reinforcing the forward line more in January? You know, the, the talk was in January that we need another striker, we need more, we need another striker. We never went and spent that money on, let's say, Shanklin, for example, or you know, and we now sort of paying the price for that, especially since the injuries are starting to pile up again now. For, for those who don't follow me on X, previously known as Twitter, you would not have seen my uh, comment this afternoon, which is basically Alan Partridge speaking into his dictaphone. And the plot line is, Shanklin doesn't move to Ibrox from heart so he can score versus Celtic rather than take any of the four dozen chances missed by Rangers in 2024. You know, call it tales of the unexpected. That is where we're at. You know, I, I, I would have said the vast majority of Rangers fans would have said sign a striker and one with a proven record. Shanklin might not be your your go-to man, but he's as good as what's around. And he's also got a fantastic track record in the SPFL, scoring for a team who probably make a quarter at best of the chances that Rangers make. And for the for the sake of a couple of million quid, you know, even for an option on the bench, surely that makes more sense than going through the the, the trials and tribulation and the utter turmoil that Rangers fans are feeling just now, when they're creating chance after chance after chance, and they are creating all these chances. I mean, the stats are incredible. You know, thirty chances made, fifteen shots on target, one goal. You know. I, I know probably 
Ali McCoy's did his best with a scored one out of every six. But even him playing in that Rangers side just now would have probably ended up with a hat trick every week. I mean, they are manufacturing the chances. The chances are coming from a whole bunch of different areas and there is nobody to take them. And and on Saturday, it cost Rangers dearly. And there's no point in anybody arguing and saying, well, we have scored goals from all over the pitch. There comes a point in time where you need somebody who gets one chance and scores. It's why so many strikers over the years have built reputations where... They are they are the ultimate hit men. You know, they only need a one chance and the ball's in the back of the net. And and those gal guys are invaluable. And currently, I'm not saying that Shanklin is the the you know anywhere near being, you know, the, the ballon d'or winner um or, or anything like that. But he's as good as there is in the, the top fight in Scotland. And honestly, I think if it wasn't him there should have been somebody else because you cannot be relying on bit part players scoring your goals. Yeah, I think we're starting to see that come to fruition now in terms of um, we should have strengthened that forward line a bit more, especially with our um, luck with injuries. Now, we we do manage to get ourselves level through a tough penalty. <coughs> um, for me, it was another example of the referee losing control of the game. Um, the VAR awards the penalty after a lengthy delay during which there seemed to be a coming together between both sets of players um, and the award of the penalty for me took far too long and the ref seemed to have lost all control of the game by this point what, what did you make of the penalty incident? I, I, I mean you look at a penalty being awarded now and, and I mean people criticise gridiron and the NFL for the time it takes for some plays to get off we're in the exact same situation just now with penalty kicks and other and, and other free kicks. You know, we are we are in a the, the game is being extended beyond belief that whereas before it was that's a penalty, put the ball in the spot, convert it, and you're back you're back up and running within a minute. Now you're looking at nearly six minutes time checking for VAR to see is this the right decision? Oh, I've spotted something else. Oh, oh, look, there's a guy in the crowd falling down the stairs. Let's watch that for 30 seconds just to have a, a bit of a laugh and then we'll get back to the game. I mean, VAR is, is causing untold grief. And you also look at the pressure that the, 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 the player, the players that are under, if you're waiting to take a penalty or whatever it is. Whereas before, you got the ball, you put it in the penalty spot, bang, it's a goal. The fact of the matter is now, through delays, through people feigning injury, through having to look to see what VAR is going to give you, it's taking like three and four and five minutes before a penalty kick can be taken. I mean, that just isn't isn't right. And it's not how football has evolved or developed over the years. I say, you could do it a lot woman last night and you've got Mr. Infantino saying, oh, you know, VAR is 99.8% correct. No, it isn't. It's 99.8% correct when you're looking for something that isn't there or you're looking for something that you haven't previously seen. It is an absolute killjoy when it comes to football. And I, and I, and I think the whole, the whole game shifted. Unfortunately for Rangers, I think it shifted with that penalty and them thinking they were back in the game. And all it did was actually give Motherwell some resolve to say, no, we were comfortable in this game before they got a dodgy penalty. Let's go out and do it again. Yeah, despite managing to get ourselves on level terms, we somehow managed to concede a second goal. Um, and this, I think this is the moment you've been waiting to talk about all evening. Um, a ball into the ball with the back post, not defended well at all. And Butland concedes that he's near post. Now, the defending at the back post was bad enough, but should Butland have actually done better there? Yeah. To, to quote the late great Andy Gorham, you're only as good as your last fuck up. And whilst Jack Butlin might be looking out flight times to take him away to the England squad and all the rest of it, it you know, it's, it's a case of do your day job. You should have saved that. That was a horrendous goal to concede. And you shouldn't have conceded it. However, I have to say, you don't need to be a, a, a tactical wizard. You don't need to be, you know, 
Otmar Hitzfeldt or Zagallo or, you know, any other fantastic, Renes Michels, you don't need to be any kind of fantastic coach throughout the years to work out that if you manage to get half a yard of space, bang the ball into the back post, especially if you're crossing from the right-hand side, because there's a good chance James Tavernier will not be there. Now, I, I know you, you, you're you a fan. I know you've got a Tav is God tattoo on your left thigh. I'm going to say it's, it's in your right buttock, but that's an entirely different story for another day. But the fact of the matter is, he, he, he mother will played into that space. And I know people will say, Oh, it just hit a, it was a hit and hope ball. It wasn't a hit and hope ball. There were easier balls to hit rather than that one. He knew who he was aiming for. The irony of irony is, of course, that the, the goal comes about and the goal comes to the guy who should have been off the pitch for the tackle that he actually committed during the game. But that's where we're at with football. It was it was chronically bad defending, um, you know, and... Nothing that we haven't come to expect over the years from various Rangers right backs, and I'm not just highlighting Tavenier here, but it was a bad goal. It was a bad goal positionally from him, and it was a horrendous goal for Butland. And and again, we touched upon it on Friday night. The saves he made, all saves are important. When you make them, is more important. And that was a save given at that time in the game that he really should have made because. Him not making that save meant the Rangers didn't take anything from the game rather than taking a point. Yeah, and the disappointing thing for me is we're conceding goals just now. It seems like the opposition don't have to work too hard to score them. We seem to be almost giving away goals through poor defending, long balls up the pitch, and our know, defenders getting bullied and you know, sloppy goals like yesterday being conceded. Um, now, Stuart, despite the fact that we've spoken all evening about how poor the performance was, and it was very poor. Is it important not to overreact to one defeat and realise that these types of games happen in a close title race? I mean, you know, it's one defeat at the end of the day, and, you know, if we go back to pre-2012, the last last time there was, you know, proper title races to talk about, we, we did often lose games in the final 10, and, you know, you would kind of think that's, you know, other side of the side got the advantage. But we did somehow manage to pull out the bag and win the title at the end of the day. Well, you know, you go back to famously Walter Smith's first title as Rangers manager. And ironically, Rangers lost 3 0 to, to Motherwell at Fur Park. A game that had, had they lost 1 0, they only needed to draw against Aberdeen. But they chased the game and lost 3 0 and then had to beat Aberdeen on the last day of the season. My reason for mentioning that is that you're at a stage in the season where your clarity of thought and your tactics and your your game management isn't always what it should be. Simply because you're under so many so much pressure to actually to to get the result and to um, you know and to 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 win specific matches. If you, if you take Rangers through their most successful periods, there have been games where they have done everything and still had to settle for either a, po- a point or they've actually come away with a defeat. I remember you know, I remember Rangers um, drawing one each at um, Ibrox against Dunfermline. Dunfermline had a handful of points that season and managed to get a, a, a draw. Um, and I think it was Advocat was the manager at the time. He just shrugged his shoulder and, and basically said these things happen. They do happen, but it's how you it's how you overcome them and how you get over them. You know, I think this weekend, Philip Clement must have taken the the uh, the get out of jail cards out of a couple of boxes of Monopoly down in down in Menzies and Argyle Street. You know, and and stuck them in his back pocket because, yeah, you know, people will say, well, Hearts at home, they're this, that, and the next thing. Hearts were absolutely turned over by Rangers last week. And personally, I did not see them doing anything against Celtic. So that is a Brucey bonus for Rangers to finish the weekend still on top of the table because basically, you know, Celtic, your biggest, your arch rivals, made a, made a mess of it. At, at Tyne Castle and Hearts turned up for once. So Rangers got away with one. 
And that just shows you the kind of twists and turns and deviations that there will be in the title running. Do I think there might be um, maybe a few more? Yes, I do. However, what I also think is I don't think Rangers might be as lucky the next time if it was to happen to them. Because that was a, you know, you could look, I mean, it's all glass half empty, glass half full. People will say, yeah, Rangers are going to go better off after today and two points in front. Rangers could have been five points in front. You know, so let me top up my glass again and I have another swig out it and I'll still be in a better position than you will for just settling for two points. So I, I think there'll be a few twists and puns Returns, but it's it's who holds their nerve and who, if they are, you know, any sort of disappointment, not just in a game, but even disappointment over the space of a matter of minutes in a match, it's who gets over that best and who basically puts that behind them and gets back on their back, you know, back on the horse, back on in their game plan and start winning matches when it looks as if they've maybe dropped a point or, or three points. Yeah, is that kind of tendency to overreact to, to one defeat? I'm thinking kind of almost within the support, almost natural given that we've not been involved in a proper title race for over a decade. There's whole swaths of Rangers fans out there that might not even know what a, a traditional title race pre-2012 feels like. Yeah, that's a, a, an extremely good point, Brian. And it, it, came, into, you know, it came into my head sort of midway through this afternoon that you have a generation of Rangers fans this is completely new for them. They cannot go back to having to win a game at Kilmarnock. They can't go back to winning a game at Tanadice. They can't go back to winning a game at Ibrox against Aberdeen, against a really, really good Aberdeen team. Um, they, they just don't have that in their archive. And, and this is something new for them. And the fact that they think that Ranger will just rock up and start winning matches left, right and centre and it will be job done and dusted... I think they could be in for a, a rude awakening. And certainly this weekend, they must have been, they must have realised this weekend that it's not as easy as what we what we thought it was going to be. So all in all, I, I, I can see it being a bit of give and take. The other, the other big thing is that before now in the end of the season, there are two old firm games. Old firm matches are always important. Even if there were 20 points between the teams, there's always a bragging rights. But this time around, they, they they matter more than they probably have done, you know, for a great many years. And and again, it's not losing those games and taking something out of those matches that ultimately I think might decide the title. I know that, you know, as as was proved this weekend, nobody would have had Motherwell and Hearts down as a double against two teams that are chasing the title, but it happened. But I think over the, the, the next couple of weeks um, and the next series of matches, what you're going to see is so much more riding on the the the, the, the games, the derby matches, the old firm games. And out of those matches, those are the ones you don't want to be losing. Yeah, I think as Rangers fans, we're going to have to buckle in because I think it's going to be a, a bumpy ride. And I can see this going almost right to the wire um, in terms of the title race. Um, so your po your positivity, your positivity. You, you, you've obviously, I'm swigging out a bottle here. It's not, it's not very good. I think it's actually liquid ice for figa by the look of it. But anyway, I'm maybe going to another bottle or something. Maybe my daughter's trying to get into my will and testament and do away with me. But anyway, <laughs> the, 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 fa the fact of the matter is that, that um, you know, I admire your, your positivity. I, I think, I'm not saying strap yourself in, buckle yourself in. You're in, you know, you'll be on the seat, your uh, edge of your seat for the next couple of weeks. I mean, Rangers could actually, if Rangers put together, the, 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 I would say the galling thing is we have seen what Rangers can do. They did it last week against Hearts. Now, I don't, I don't know anybody who would have watched that Hearts game and saw what Rangers did in that Hearts game and then think that two games later they're going to come out and and basically turn turn in such an abject performance against Motherwell. The, the, I'll, I'll, I'll say it again, the galling thing was that Motherwell didn't have to be that good to beat Rangers. And that, for me, would be the, the, the concern. I mean, we, you know, our, our, our sort of group chat, we were saying various things, and you were, you were saying about the injuries. I, I don't disagree with that. 
but not winning the games you should be winning is is what would what will cost you know any team going for the title that will cost them most of all. My, my worry just is that the injuries are going to catch up. And for me, when I look at that team yesterday, I just look at the forward line of Dessels, Sterling and McCausland, and I just I can't see how that's a forward line that, that gets you over the line in a, in a title race where it's this tight. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. I, I, I mean, I hope. Back. I, I mean, I, I, I wholly agree with you. I mean, that is a real, that is a real bits and pieces lineup, isn't it? it it's not. Yeah. I have to say, it's not quite as bad as the team that finished against Aberdeen when Rangers won two 0 to win the title, where it was be anybody who was actually breathing or could actually hop about in one leg was still on the pitch. I mean that was that's when you really are down to the boards and you really are asking people to perform, you know, in the in, in the most dire situations. But I I don't I don't think Philippe Clement and he's you know when he's lying there at night scheming um you know the next Rangers team is thinking to himself, well wait a minute here here's here's one that nobody's seen coming, Sterling in one side and McCausland in the other. Nah, you know that is that is beyond anybody's wildest fantasy or wildest dream. So I, I think there are one or two Rangers players you're looking to get back ASAP, if only to give you a bit of shape and a bit of normality, um, let alone some match-winning performances. Yeah, I think so. The sooner we get some of those players back, the better. Now, before we finish up, Stuart, we'll quickly preview the yes. um, trip to Braga on Thursday night as we return to Europa League. Action. Um, I had a quick look at Braga's kind of where they were sitting in their table. They, they currently sit top of the league, and when the draw came out, it was kind of widely accepted. It's one of the harder draws that we could have gotten. How do you see this one going? Well, I mean, yeah, well, after Saturday, you would say, "Oh, this is a, a welcome interlude back to European competition, back to trying to take the team forward." Um, in Europe, and you know, and again, I think uh, Philippe Clement is the kind of guy who will be looking at this as an opportunity, as a chance, as a very good chance to further, you know, the Rangers' cause, to further the Rangers' name in European competition, and to take his team into a position where who knows where they might get to the sharp end of another knockout tournament. Yeah, I see all of these things. Equally, he knows he has to come back next weekend if he's going to get a title. And, uh, you know, and uh, that's a dead easy question to ask. What would you take? Would you take your domestic title or maybe get to a final of another European competition? And there'll be smart arses out there and say, oh, I'll take both. Well, OK, um, you take both and take a sniff of something else as well, because these things don't really happen in the real world too often. But it's it's actually, I have to say, the Triumph Scotsman, it's no hooch. It's from my good sponsor, Steve Perez, who sent me up another couple of cases of vodka kick. Um, but anyway, no, um, it's, it's, it, I think it's a, it's a welcome break. And the thing is, it's actually something to look forward to. Rangers fans can look forward to this because Europe has given them such an absolutely mega ride. Regardless of who the managers have been, Rangers have done really, really well in European competition, which wasn't always the case. You know, I, I, you, 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 go, you go back to the famous hedge in, in, in Luxembourg all those many moons ago and think where Rangers were there and, and what has subsequently quant- come through Steven Gerrard and the performances that Rangers produced under him, eventually getting to uh, a final under Giovanni Van Bronckhorst, and there's been a continuation of that through Philippe Clement as well. So I think it's it's a, a furtherment of the Rangers name, the Rangers brand uh, in European competition, but I, I don't think there's any denying that I, I think a, a number of people will be seeing this as a bit of a distraction and taking away from your mince and tatties of the SPFL. Yeah, I think that's kind of compounded with the <laughs> amount of injuries that we've oh, sorry, got. Sorry, um, sorry, wait a minute here. CF3 loyal, send a crate my way. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put up a, 
I'll put up a prize and I'll ask a question. The next time I'm on the podcast, I'll ask a question and I'll put up a case of it for you. There you go. So I'll, 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 uh, I was partial to Bacardi Breezer back in the day. That's Stuart. I'll speak to him after the show. I bet he was into Bazik as well for those of us old enough as well. But <laughs> listen, um, listen, I'll put up a prize. There you go. And we'll, we'll have a, a, wee, a wee quiz question at some point in time. We're now, we're now off Rangers, I have to say, on the comments board here. We're on the MD 2020. <laughs> Jer's net, Black Ice, Smirnoff. All the way, uh, p- pineapple breezers, Bacardi breezers, you name it. So we're, we're now a drink program. So welcome to Jersnet. Happy Hooch Day! But uh, no, listen, I, 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 I'm looking for Rangers to turn on a performance again, and and for guys who may not be getting a chance league wise to actually turn on a bit of performance. I mean, with the amount of injuries that we've got, the manager's running out of options. I mean, we don't yet know if McCausland's going to be fit for the game. But well, the, the guys that have been playing league wise, there might not be. There may not be that many. Options to turn to. <laughs> correct, correct. And and that, you know, going back to the point you made when we were on our, on our, on our, on our kind of chat room earlier on, that point is very, very valid. That you're basically asking guys, you're patching guys up to send them out in a midweek game that you know you want to be competitive in, but equally you know that these guys that you're patching up, you want them to be fit again for the for the, the, the Sunday. And that's putting a big demand, I was just going to say, on your squad or your pool of players, that's putting a big demand on 14 or 15 guys that you're turning to just now, week in, week out, because that's all you've got. Yes, it is getting to, to bare bone stuff. Now, you kind of mentioned it earlier, sure, but given that this is the first leg, is the main aim of this task just to come away from Benfica still in the tie, given that we've still got the whole leg the next week? We've seen it so often in both of our runs to the last stages of the, the Europa League, where we would go away from home first and we'd come back with, you know, at worst a 1 0 deficit, and then we keep coming <coughs> that around the eyebrows the Thursday night. Is that kind of the main aim here? Um, the, the the whole mindset of European football, I have to say, Brian, for some of us dinosaurs who wanted, um, t- to start with, you wanted the away leg first, you wanted to get a goal, an away goal, because it meant you'd have the job to do when you come back home, and, and that was your mindset. That then changed when the Lacey game soon as came in and said, no, I want you to play the home game first. Because even if you draw 0-0 and you don't concede a goal, you only need to score one abroad and you're in the box seat. Now that's changed again because away goals don't count. Personally, I think it's a... I don't think it's added anything to football. I think I think football become even more cagey. And if, you know, watching TNT Sport uh, and the likes and they're going through the Champions League, through the, the different years, you know, 92, 93, 93, 94, all, all go through the different years. And you see teams that had to get a result either at home or away from home. And some of the goals that were scored, nobody's going to tell me that the Champions League football wasn't better back then than, than, than what it is now. So, you know, I think I think Rangers would be looking for a, a kind of result. The thing that would worry me was if they don't get a, a decent scoreline at the first leg, is the drop off where they're saying, "Well, we're not going to get this back in the second game," and it doesn't really matter what the crowd does at Ibrox; they're they're already at the tie, and it's it's their mindset and recovering from that, getting into the the league matches that then suddenly you know becomes a bit of a a, a chore or a bit of an onus. I think whilst they're at it just now, I think every game is like a a, a cup tie or a cup final, and it's dead easy to be uh, riding on a high when you've got those matches coming. I, I think, you know, Rangers have got a chance to recover from this weekend by having a match almost immediately. I know it's Thursday, but you know, a big match to pick up again on and, and and take it from there. So you're just looking for a level of consistency. And can I just say, the trying Scotsman again, Stuart, Mr. Buckfast, I have never touched Buckfast in my life. The smell of it, you know, is enough. Uh, it, it was cheaper than Castrolar when I was running my Mark II Escort. It was, um, that's the only thing I would use it for. 
So no chance of ever seeing maybe a bottle of buck fast. I do have other spirits uh, handily available. A uh, bottle of uh, Tullamore Dew for anybody out there. Lovely with the uh, cloudy apple juice, let me tell you. But uh, I, maybe, I maybe start on that later, depending on how I feel. Um, feel strength recommendations. You don't get this on any other podcast, I'll tell you that. Absolutely not. No, I, I, trust me. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. Right. I think we'll call it time there. All that's left me to do is thank my guest, Stuart. Thanks as always. Cheers. We're now onto the tangerine juice. <laughs> Cheers. Right. We will be live tonight. The show will be available on all podcasting platforms. iTunes, Spotify, Acast, Stitcher. And they'll probably be back on Friday evening to review all the action from our game at Benfica and preview our Scottish Cup match against Hibs. Until next time, bye for now. All the best, folks.